Well, good evening. Uh, before we begin, let's begin as we should always begin in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your presence with us this evening. Thank you for gathering a wonderful group of people that loves life, cherishes life, believes in the incredible creative power and beauty that you are, and infuses your life into all you make and all you create, especially human beings. How wonderful you are. How glorious you are. How praiseworthy you are. We lift up to you, dear Lord, our reality as we live in our day. And we ask you, dear Lord, to extend your hand over all that we see and feel and know that is contrary to your beauty, that you, in the way that only you can, using us as you will, absorb it, change it, transform it. All glory, honor, and praise to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Dr. Stephen Lockman, and I am the president of St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry. As moderator of tonight's discussion and as president, I would like to thank you for coming tonight to this panel discussion on the expansion of abortion in New York State. I welcome both those physically present and those who will join us tonight over the internet. Although St. Bernard's is not part of the Pastoral Center, nor the Office of Evangelization and Catechesis, it is avowedly Catholic, and thereby in communion with the diocese, specifically in its response and opposition to the Reproductive Health Care Act passed recently in this state. Over the past few months, our bishop has requested varied responses to the Health Care Act from people who work in the pastoral center and from those who work outside of it, both those who are Catholic and those who are not. As a school that has close ties with the Finger Lakes Medical Guild, which is part of the Catholic Medical Association and is represented here tonight by people on this panel, we thought that a discussion concerning this issue from the perspective of education for the sake of local action would at least be something that we as an educational institution contribute to this initiative. I think that I can speak for most everyone here concerning the sadness and frankly the anger at the attacks that the Church's pro-life ethos has suffered over the past 60 years. I speak not only of the Health Care Act to be discussed tonight, um, and not only of the increasing violence perpetrated upon Christians, both here and abroad, but also of the wholesale ignorance of the teachings of our Church concerning the dignity and the worth of the human person, and how these might be supported and even defended. One of my greatest fears is that without concerted efforts on the part of the entirety of the Catholic community, we will lose not only the fight over abortion, but that the whole of the anti-life ethos will overwhelm both Christian and non-Christian alike, thus making it impossible to have any discussion between our Catholic faith 
from the rest of secular society. Through St. Bernard's, we are trying to recover much that has been lost, especially those principles and doctrines that are at the heart of the proper regard of the human person from conception to natural death. To recover the beauty, <coughs> the depth, the breadth, the heights of what it is to be made to the image and likeness of God, and in the process, to not be conformed to this age is something we hope will allow for the transformation of both heart and mind which St. Paul exhorts us at Romans 12 to occur, so that we might know the will and mind of God and of all things that are perfect, good, and true. Whether this is through events, such as this one tonight, or through courses dedicated, for example, to St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, or to Catholic Spirituality and Culture, two courses that are offered here, the latter of which is being offered together with the monks at the Abbey of the Genesee. See our table of the back for information. <laughs> we believe that there is great hope in what we, in union with others within the Catholic community and beyond, can affect through our acts of charity. So tonight, we welcome six speakers to address the issues surrounding the expansion of abortion in New York State, as well as the larger issues surrounding our pro-life ethos. We have Kathleen Gallagher, who serves as the Director of Pro-Life Activities for the New York State Catholic Conference. We have Dr. Jean Merrick Parker, who currently serves on Ethics Committees of the National Catholic Medical Association and New York State's Stem Cell Board. This fall, she'll be teaching a course here at St. Bernard's in Catholic Bioethics, something for which I'm eternally grateful. Alicia Sanchez's speech is a board-certified family physician and a NAPRO technology consultant. Suzanne Stack is the Life Issues Coordinator for Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Rochester. Father Anthony Lodovero is pastor of Holy Apostles Church in Rochester. And finally, Ellen Wayne serves as the Executive Director of Catholic Charities of the Finger Lakes. So, what we'll do, we'll begin with presentations. First, from Kathleen Gallagher, after which, then, we will have uh, short presentations of about 10, maybe 12 minutes, <laughs> uh, concerning various aspects that touch upon that for which we have gathered tonight. So then, our first speaker is Kathleen Gallagher. She serves as the Director of Pro-Life Activities for the New York, State Catholic Con the New York State Catholic Conference. Based in Albany, uh, Mrs. Gallagher represents the state's Roman Catholic bishops in presenting the church's life-related policy positions to legislators, the media, and other groups statewide. She's now in her 36th year with the Catholic Conference. She is proud of numerous policy accomplishments, including the enactment of a ban on surrogate motherhood, the enactment of the prenatal care assistance program for low-income mothers, and 12 years of successfully preventing the RHA abortion expansion in our state. Let us please welcome Kathleen Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm really grateful to whoever brought the wine. <laughs> it's my job to uh, outline for you in a very brief period of time what the Reproductive Health Act does to our law here in New York State. So, um, like many of you, I was not surprised, but devastated and heartbroken when this law was passed on January 22nd of this year. We had worked very hard for at least a dozen years to stop it from passing. But once the November 2018 elections took place and so many of the candidates actually ran on a platform of enacting this law, uh, we knew that uh, it was going to be enacted. So again, not surprising, but still heartbreaking to me personally, to our bishops and to so many Catholic and non-Catholic people. Okay, so I'm gonna outline what the law does. Five things, five things. Number one, 
The first thing the law does is it elevates abortion to the level of a fundamental right in New York State. Legally, this means that there would have to be a compelling state interest for any restriction or regulation of that fundamental right to abortion. So things like parental notification laws when minors get abortions, or restrictions on taxpayer funding of abortion. While these kinds of laws are actually enacted and working in a vast majority of our states in this country, something like 38 states have those kinds of laws, the enactment of the Reproductive Health Act pretty much ensures that while that's on the books, we're not going to be able to enact any of those very reasonable regulations or restrictions on abortion. I'm still on number one. So in addition to elevating abortion to the level of a fundamental right, the law also says that the state of New York, the state government, may not interfere with, deny, or discriminate against that fundamental right to abortion. That language is kind of ominous, and we don't really know what that means at this point in time. I think it is frightening for us because I think it will jeopardize our right to religious liberty. So for example, let me just give you a few possibilities. The State Education Department is the bureaucratic agency that licenses medical professionals. If someone wants to be licensed as a doctor or a nurse in New York State and they are outspokenly pro-life, can the state give them a license to practice or will the state then be discriminating against a fundamental right? Similarly, if the state health department, which gives operating certificates to hospitals and medical facilities, if a new Catholic healthcare clinic wants to open up and doesn't provide abortions, could the state give an operating certificate or would they be denying women their fundamental right to abortion? So you can see that we don't know what the consequences of that language is going to be, but I fear the worst. Um, I think there's also possibilities that it could jeopardize any funding in New York that goes to life-affirming services. Right now we have a program in New York called the Maternity and Early Childhood Foundation that was started in 1983. Every year we've gotten state funding that goes to programs that help women bring their babies to term. Does that funding discriminate against the fundamental right to abortion? I think that our opponents in this battle would say it does. Because their argument is, for every dollar that the state government puts in a pregnant woman's hand, they have to give her the choice of what to do with that dollar. So I fear for the funding for life-affirming services. Okay, so that's number one, fundamental right. Very frightening, very ominous. Number two, it eliminated restrictions on late-term abortions. Previously, our law said that abortions were allowed in the seventh, eighth, and ninth month of, of pregnancy only if a woman's life, her very life, was in danger. The Reproductive Health Act added the health exception. So now the law says if the patient's life or health is in danger, abortions are permissible in the third trimester of pregnancy. Unfortunately, we have case law from the US Supreme Court, which has defined health. And health means not only physical health, <coughs> but emotional health, family circumstances, a patient's age, all of those things, said the US Supreme Court, contribute to a patient's total well-being and health. Therefore, the law allows abortion for all nine months of pregnancy for virtually any reason. 
I recently read some testimony from Dr. Tony Levantino, who's a former abortionist who actually worked at Albany Medical Center and stopped doing abortions. Um, but he, he told in his testimony to Congress, he spoke about being an abortionist and having a patient present to him who was about five months pregnant. She was a young woman. And when he asked her why she wanted to have the abortion, she said, because I want to go to my prom. And he said he realized at that moment that he could just check the little box that said medically necessary. And he could do that for any of his patients because it was for her total well-being and health. So that's what we're left with, ladies and gentlemen. We're left with a law that says it is okay to terminate the lives of unborn children in the seventh, eighth, and ninth month of pregnancy. Babies, the same ones we watch joyfully, kicking their legs, sucking their thumbs on the ultrasound machines. The same ones who respond to sound and light and pain. Those same babies can now be taken for virtually any reason. I think what, what this section of the law will actually do in practice is invite in to New York State, late-term abortionists from neighboring states who couldn't do this without fear of prosecution. So you probably remember the name of Kermit Gosnell, the abortionist in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has a very strict law that is enforced that prosecutes abortionists who take the lives of children in the last trimester of pregnancy unless the mother's physical health, her physical health is gravely endangered. Kerbet Gosnell, in addition to being convicted of murder and other heinous crimes, was also convicted of 24 counts of illegal third trimester abortions. Here in New York, there are no more illegal third trimester abortions. So I think the law says to people like that, Come on into New York. Set up your shop here. We're not going to prosecute you. The third thing that the law did, it allows non-doctors to perform abortions. Previously, the law said that only a duly licensed physician was permitted to perform abortion. Now the law says any authorized, licensed, or certified healthcare practitioner may perform abortion. We don't really know who that means. There's a lot of speculation that it will mean nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and certified midwives. But the bottom line is, the practical reality is, that will allow our state education department to decide whose scope of practice will allow them to perform abortions, whether it be early term abortions or late term abortions, whether it be surgical abortions or chemical abortions. We don't know. That will be decided by bureaucrats in the state education department. So that's kind of frightening, not just for the unborn children, but for the women involved as well. Fourth. <coughs> It removed specific protections in our law for children who might mistakenly be born alive during the late-term abortion. Previously, our public health law had a very tight section in it which said that if a late-term abortion was to be performed, a second physician had to be present to provide immediate medical care to any child who might accidentally survive the procedure. That section of law also said that that child, once born, immediately had all the civil rights protections of the law that you and I enjoy. That particular section of law was completely repealed by the Reproductive Health Act. I still shake my head and wonder why. Like, why do they have to do that? There doesn't seem to be a good reason particularly because the advocates for the Reproductive Health Act said all along, we want to take abortion out of the criminal law, because it's not a crime, and we want to put it into the public health law. 
You want to mainstream it as a public health service. Okay, so they did that, but then they also took a piece of our public health law and ripped it away, leaving these children without any protection whatsoever under our law. And I think a question you might be thinking is, well, does that happen? Do children really survive late-term abortions? Yeah, it does happen. And uh, there are people, walking, talking, breathing people among us who indeed have survived late-term abortions. So yes, it does happen. And fifth and finally, in taking abortion out of the criminal code completely, the Reproductive Health Act removed the criminality of unwanted abortions, coerced abortions, involuntary abortions. And just in the few months since the law was enacted and took effect, we have seen multiple cases, domestic violence cases, horrible, brutal cases, where women have been bludgeoned to death pregnant women and their infants inside of them, bludgeoned to death. And there is no crime, there is no accountability any longer, no matter what the advocates say, because I know they say it's still a crime, there is no crime any longer in New York State for intentionally targeting that child and taking that child's life. Again, 38 states across this country, including California, I might add, allow for a double homicide in such cases. New York never did. We wrote a bill, we have a bill that's still pending to allow for a double homicide in such cases. Never went anywhere. All we had here in New York State was the crime of illegal abortion. And now that's gone. We have nothing. I have a, uh, a story here from the New York Times because there was just another case in Brooklyn in the month of April where a 20-year-old who was two months pregnant was butchered to death with an ax and almost decapitated. And I have the New York Times story here about it, and it quotes her aunt. Miss Rivera had recently learned that she was pregnant and was looking forward to the birth of her second child, her aunt said, quote, he took two lives, not just hers. It was her and the baby she had in her womb. We want justice for two, said her aunt. They will never get that justice now. It breaks my heart because we told the legislative leaders, we told the assembly speaker and the Senate majority leader and the governor, if you pass this Reproductive Health Act the way you have it written right now, this is what's gonna happen. And sure enough, we've had, I count, at least three cases now, horrible cases, where families will not get justice. It didn't have to be that way. We even offered them language that didn't bestow any personhood on the unborn child that they should have been able to live with to allow for a second crime and allow for some accountability and justice. But no, they didn't do it. Um, and that, I guess that part breaks my heart probably more than anything else because these cases are so horrible and they're very much wanted children these are women who have made a choice to keep their child, and they're having that choice violently ripped away from them by a third-party perpetrator. Roe versus Wade never gave that third-party perpetrator the right to take away the child. So that's my simple explanation of the five parts of the Reproductive Health Act. Did the Reproductive Health Act simply codify Roe versus Wade as we heard over and over and over again by our governor and legislative leaders? No, it did not. It went much, much further than Roe versus Wade. Did we need it here in New York State? Absolutely not. We have the highest abortion rate of any state in the country, double the national average. No woman was having difficulty finding an abortion here in New York State. This was pure politics, pure political payback to Planned Parenthood, the, American, the Civil Liberties Union, and other pro-choice groups that gave campaign dollars to lawmakers. Thank you.
please come up. Our next speaker is Father Anthony Mugavero. He has been ordained in the Diocese of Rochester since 1981. He is presently happily assigned to serve the people of Holy Apostles Church in Rochester. Now, he has served in many churches throughout the diocese and has brought great comfort to the poor and the dispossessed through his leadership and pastoral care. Even learning Spanish so that more, more effectively you can say the Latino community had a lot of fun reading that on Father probably has a, a father has a, a great video on YouTube about what priesthood has meant to his life. Uh, you should check it out. We'd be really glad if you did. Uh, he's involved with Christ Life, a Catholic ministry for evangelization that equips Catholics for the essential work of evangelization, so that all people might personally encounter Jesus Christ and be transformed into his missionary disciples. Just please welcome Father Mary. Every year, with the help of others, I take a busload of youth to the March for Life in Washington. As part of this pilgrimage for life, we always try to visit the Holocaust Museum. Visiting this museum helps our youth to see the broader field on which evil has played its hand, and helps our youth to be able to connect the dots from one end of the field to the other. As you enter the Holocaust Museum as a group, you get on an elevator, and as the doors close, a video plays which has the Allied commanders during World War II saying that they have come across an unimaginable horror, at which point the elevator has reached its destination, and its doors open, and you exit and begin your journey through the museum. Upon exiting the elevator and beginning, no one needs to tell you to be quiet. The quiet and the silence simply descend upon you as you take in through the exhibits the comprehensive dehumanization of people horrifically carried out, taking your breath away. It numbs you and your senses as you are assaulted over and over again by the most hideous and systematic destruction of human beings. Part of the history of the Holocaust was an attempt to try and keep hidden what was actually happening in the concentration camps. In one of the videos we show our youth, there's actually film footage showing American soldiers who had liberated the camps, bringing ordinary German citizens into a nearby concentration camp to reveal to them what they found there. On the way there, these citizens are smiling, laughing, and joking as if they are walking to a picnic. However, on their way out from the concentration camp, the looks on their faces are totally different. They are crying and sobbing in disbelief at what they had just seen. The evil was so real. The evil was so awful, and it had taken place right in their backyard. As terribly bad as the Nazis were, somehow they knew, even unconsciously, that what they were doing should not be known, that it would not serve their interests, and that ultimately, if it were brought to light, it would be seen as the unspeakable and horrific evil it actually was. Nearly 74 years have passed since the end of World War II, but over time, evil has grown in its arrogant character. We have seen this in our very own time, when some of the most grotesque acts of evil have not only been committed and not hidden, but have been deliberately displayed in real time for all to see. Human beings beheaded, 
burned alive in cages, crucified, literally. Evil, beyond the scope of anything imaginable, has taken off the cloak of hiddenness and invisibility and is giving into its own hellish energy to put all of its doings out there publicly without apology. Of course, we are now seeing this very same movement of evil within the arena of innocent, unborn human beings in the passage of the horrific law of abortion expansion in New York State. Governor Andrew Cuomo, smiling as he signed this law and surrounded by those smiling as well, said, the Reproductive Health Act is a historic victory for New Yorkers and for our progressive values. I am directing that New York's landmarks be lit in pink to celebrate this achievement and shine a bright light forward for the rest of the nation to follow. And so, the World Trade Center was lit up in pink to celebrate this law. The very monument that exists because 3,000 people lost their lives one tragic day now being used to celebrate a horrific evil that kills more than 3,000 babies every day. This law allows abortions that's been described to us up to the time of birth. Regardless of when an abortion takes place, in terms of the development of the unborn child, the result is exactly the same. The killing of an innocent human being. Nevertheless, the taking of that unborn life, when all the resemblances of who and what a human being is are fully present, developed, and known, is egregious in a particular way. At the level of an awareness that is available to all, no denial of scientific fact or excuse of conscience conscience is possible. What is being done and what is happening in an abortion of a fully formed infant is clear to everyone. An innocent infant, human being, is being mercilessly killed in the cruelest and most barbaric of ways. And the demonic nature of the intrinsic evil of abortion is made clear than ever before. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadems. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky and hurled them down to earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth, to devour her child when she gave birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and its angels fought back, but they did not prevail, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The huge dragon the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and its angels were thrown down with it. When the dragon saw that it had been thrown down to the earth, it pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman escaped. Then the dragon became angry with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Because each child is made in the image and likeness of God and carries the potency and reminder of that precious reality, demonic evil hates and despises every child coming into this world. In addition, each and every child is a further manifestation of the way that the Lord himself chose to enter into our world and become human. 
God himself chose to become incarnate by being conceived and going through each and every step of the process that each and every unborn child must go through in the womb until the very day of his own birth on earth in Bethlehem. From a hellish perspective, every child conceived in the womb is a reminder of that, and for that reason, every child in the womb is hated and deplored. If Satan had his way, every child would be targeted for destruction and extermination in order to blot out all the memory of the divine image, the divine intervention, and the divine humility in the Incarnation. All of this indicates with whom our battle really lies. As St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. All of this not only indicates with whom our battle really lies, but also the way in which we will fight this battle. We will fight this battle with the deepest spiritual lives of which we are capable, and by using the most powerful spiritual resources we have, and bring them into the heart of this very fight. The Lord once said of the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against that. Sometimes, with images, we get our wires crossed, and the image gets applied in a way exactly the opposite of how it was intended. In reference to the church, I often find that people tend to put the gates around the church and interpret the words of Jesus as if we, as a church, will withstand all of the attacks of the devil. While we believe that this is true, nonetheless, the image given by Jesus has been incorrectly applied. The gates of which Jesus is speaking of are not around the church. They are the gates of hell. They are around hell. And those gates have been put around hell to try and defend it and its hellish acts and deeds of evil. According to this image given us by Jesus, the church is not in a defensive posture, but rather it is completely on the offensive and attacking the gates of hell. We are called to take the fight to hell. This reminds me of something General George Patton once spoke to his commanders in the field. He told them, don't tell me you are holding your position. Let the enemy try to say that. I want you to be attacking day and night. And so the call is to go to the gates of hell as a church and to continually be lobbying over its gates our acts of love and sacrifice and prayer and fasting and to douse hell with heaven's love and the church's authority. To show up at the gates where all this horrific evil is occurring in bringing all of our most powerful spiritual resources, the intercession of all the angels and saints, the intercession of the army of martyrs who have been aborted, as well as the intercession of those now with the Lord who had terminated pregnancies, the intercession of pro-life warriors now with the Lord, and the intercession of Mary, who held fears most outside of Jesus than anyone else, <coughs> and under her many titles, especially Our Lady of Guadalupe. We are called to show up, bringing our most powerful prayers and devo devotions, encircling the gates of hell with the rosary and the chaplet of divine mercy, calling on the intercession of St. Michael and all the heavenly hosts, and wherever possible, bringing the Lord himself present in the blessed sacrament in his body and blood, soul and divinity, to the gates of hell in his name, claiming all those who are trapped within those gates and being one with our shepherds 
who use the power of Jesus entrusted to them to bind and to loose, transforming all that is within those gates. With our Lord's love and light, attacking day and night, we have it on very good authority that those gates of hell will not prevail and they will come down. Now, to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think by the power at work among us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. previously worked in medical research at the Veterans Administration and the Eastman Dental Center at the University of Rochester. Those studies led to certification in Catholic bioethics from the National Catholic Bioethics Center, where she explored the moral implications of egg donation, particularly as it violates women's inherent dignity. More recently, Jean earned her doctorate in bioethics from the Loyola University at Chicago where she focused on international ethical guidelines for embryonic stem cell research. She currently serves on ethics committees of the National Catholic Medical Association and New York State's Stem Cell Board. This fall, I'm very happy to say, yet yeah, once again, that she'll be teaching a course here at St. Bernard's in Catholic Bioethics. Mm -hmm. So please, let us welcome Dr. Parker. Thank you, Dr. Lachman. After the, hearing the past two speakers give very sobering accounts of bad laws, bad politics, um, horrific wars, uh, man-made and spiritual, I hope to maybe lighten things a little bit um, and talk about the other side of that, um, the Catholic view of life, and um, to get into a little bit of the history of um, its stance on abortion um, and the principles that underlie it that are a bright shining light um, in, in the face of this evil we're facing. And um, just, you, Father Mother you mentioned the um, jubilation of the legislators. Um, that was a sad day. And um, I think I was sad until I got mad when I watched the news that night and saw all the pink buildings lit up. It was sort of like, how dare you take public buildings and do this? And it's such a divided, I mean, the constituency in New York is, and the whole country is so divided on this issue. Um, it's not a celebration, it's a sign of division. But, um, so, let me just make sure I can do these. Which one point it out? Ah, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the, the bright light, the church's stance on light, and talking about how it has viewed abortion uh, through the centuries. From the very beginning, there is absolutely no confusion um, in Christianity's eyes about the value of life and the um, grave immorality of abortion and infanticide. In fact, as early as the first century, the Didache, which was written, claimed to have been written by the 12 apostles, or collectively, or their immediate 
students or uh, helpers talks about, specifically talks about um, the way to live this new Christian life and says, you shall not kill by abortion the fruit of the womb and you shall not murder the infant already born. So right out of the, right out of the Christian gate, we are handling and talking about this issue. And frankly, we really haven't stopped since, and we haven't changed our position. The Church Father Tertullian and St. Basil the Great um, spoke and wrote about abortion and infanticide, different aspects, but nonetheless, it was sort of, it was on their minds, it was on the Church's minds. The Council of Mainz uh, talked about penalties and prohibitions of abortion, and St. Thomas Aquinas, um, Something he wrote in the Summa is so relevant to the Reproductive Health Act that I had to give him his own slide. Oops, wrong way. I'll get this, I'll figure it out. Um, and this deals with the last point uh, Kathy Gallagher spoke about with the uh, assault on women. Um, he that strikes a woman with child does something unlawful. Wherefore, if there rest, results the death either of the woman or the animated fetus, he will not be excused from homicide. So, um, wished he was around now to uh, have addressed the RHA. It was pretty clear in his mind. And continuing on into more modern uh, history, Vatican II addressed this in uh, one of its papers, and there's been a slew of post-Vatican II papers that have come out and have talked about abortion, especially in modern day terms with some of the other things that are related to it. And um, all of these um, documents are freely available. Um, and um, I think what I wanted to point out was that it, in, in sort of the big picture of them is, whereas prior to maybe in the, in, the early church documents that talked about abortion and focused on the Abortion Act itself and um, penalties for the mother or those involved in abortion. Some of these documents really talk more about the bigger picture, the social picture, uh, how this isn't just a problem with the woman. The woman is under duress many times and many, feels many times backed into it. So the church has uh, never changed its position, but it's broadened it on abortion and infanticide. So what did the church, what does the church base its strong, long-lasting stance on? These are fundamental, two fundamental principles actually. One is the dignity of the human person. And we hear, you know, human dignity, it's a simple thing, we hear it all the time. But it actually is a very Catholic thing and it is a very um, profound concept. The concept arises from uh, Imago Dei, which Father Romero referred to, were made in the image and likeness of God. Unlike any of the other creatures he made, we are in some fashion in his image and likeness. And therefore, we have great dignity from that. But not that alone. God didn't just create us and let us go off on our ways. He calls us into a relationship with him, a personal relationship. Um, he wants us to love him, and he wants us to love us back. And uh, we have the church, the sacraments, grace, all sorts of things, community to help with that. Um, and the fact that the second person of the Trinity um, assumed human nature in the, in the man Jesus Christ and became human so he could further help us and lead us to the Father uh, and then ultimately redeem us is, is also a major factor in our high human dignity. And lastly, we have an immortal soul that is not going to die when our body dies and that is because God loves us so much he wants us to be with him forever. So uh, you put this whole picture together, and we are unlike the dogs, the cats, the horses, who are all majestic in their own way, but we have this special human dignity. The second major fundamental principle from which the church draws its opposition to abortion is the right to life. Again, a simple phrase, right? But it actually is the first right, a condition of all the other rights, 
And all other rights are meaningless without it. Our forefathers got it right when they talked about the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't think that order was a mistake. So you put these two principles together, and you could see that we are on firm standing, and it's a positive standing on why human beings are so valuable. And this has led the church to say that human beings are so valuable that we are valuable from the moment we're conceived through our natural death. So, the church is opposed to uh, the RHA and has spent formidable um, uh, time and energy and many years fighting it. And the reason it has is because they know, based on these principles, it is immoral. The deliberate killing of a human life, it violates those two principles I talked about. Moreover, it is inequitable. Um, it deprives lawful civil protections that the rest of us have from a particular segment of the human population. That's the unborn. And, um, you know, we had laws like that in the past in this country. It was called slavery and other things. Um, so we have an immoral law, it's inequitable, and therefore it is an unjust law. And um, St. Augustine famously said, an unjust law is no law at all. And he was right. And Martin Luther King actually used this phrase uh, when he was describing civil, uh, when he was in, in the midst of, actually from prison, I believe. But there's hope. So I'm here to say, um, you know, what can be done? Because, again, this is sobering. The Reproductive Health Act is a sobering law. It's, it seems bigger than us. What, what can we do? It's law. And it doesn't look like the, the politically things are going to change, at least not in the near future. But there is hope. And here's why. Because there is um, the beginnings of an attempt to have a lawsuit against the legality of the um, Reproductive Health Act. The Feminist Choosing Life of New York is an organization that's pro-woman and pro-life. It's based here in Rochester. It's been around for many years, and they have done extraordinary work for women and children, and unborn children particularly. But um, they have fought against the RHA, and they are in the process of pulling together right now. And this is not public knowledge yet, so I think this may be the first audience that hears this. Um, pulling together a, a formidable legal team statewide to explore and mount a comprehensive legal challenge to the RHA. That's good news, I would say. When you, uh, <laughs> there is hope. And, you know, who knows how that will go, but whichever way it goes, we know there's going to be appeals. Uh, maybe it'll make its way to the Supreme Court. Wouldn't that be? a very good thing. Maybe something good will come out of something bad. And I did want to give just a shout out to um, Feminist uh, Choosing Life in New York Executive Director, Michelle Strelacy, of course, is here. She is, her, she is a lawyer herself and uh, Executive Director, and the President, Carol Crossan, too. <laughs> focus on the legal claims of how the act jeopardizes the health and safety of women in addition to infringing upon the rights of the uh, viable unborn children. So it will look at a few different aspects. And um, there are a couple of things we can do to help. And I think this is, you know, you know, it's easy to feel helpless, right? It seems overwhelming. There are things we can do. Right now, it's very important to identify and um, plaintiffs that could sign on to this lawsuit. Um, and uh, to be a plaintiff, one has to have been shown harm in some way to the law. These are the categories of people that conceivably could be harmed. And we, as Kathleen Gallagher mentioned, we already have at least three cases where we know where their unborn babies were murdered and could not be uh, adequately prosecuted, the perpetrators uh, could not be prosecuted. So these are some groups of people that would have standing to sign on to a plaintiff like this. And it's very important because without these people, plaintiffs, real people like you and me, who have been harmed, 
um, we can't bring the lawsuit. Um, so we need this. So I would just ask anybody to think about, if you know any people, or you yourself, any of these groups, uh, know of any people, I would say please see Michelle or Carol Crossett about this, or call Feminists for Life, or um, their, their uh, website is there. And of course, donations. This is going to be, this is going to be a major lawsuit that will get national attention. And we need to fund it. We need to uh, do what we can to make sure it can continue to, you know, get the traction it needs and not be inhibited because it doesn't have enough money. This could go to the Supreme Court. So I would just like to say there is hope. And um, please, um, if you have any other questions, visit the website or see one of the people here tonight. Thank you. experience serving in leadership roles in nonprofit organizations that address poverty. Ellen previously served as Director of Community Development for the Cayuga Seneca Community Action Agency and as the Director of Temporary Assistance for the Seneca County Department of Social Services. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Scranton, a Master of Public Administration from SUNY Berkeley and a Doctorate of Education in Executive Leadership from St. John Fisher College, where her area of research was maintaining Catholic identity in the delivery of secular funded services. She currently participates in the Catholic Charities USA, USA Mission and Identity Committee, and in that capacity assists in the planning and presenting of training at the National Conference. Ellen also serves as an adjunct faculty uh, member at St. John Fisher College teaching in the graduate and doctoral programs offered through the Wilson School of Education. Please let us welcome Alan Martin. Charities of the Finger Lakes and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Rochester, it is my pleasure to join this panel tonight and to speak with you this evening regarding such an important topic. As you may be aware, Catholic Charities, through our Justice and Peace Ministry efforts and under the guidance of the Diocesan Public Policy Committee, annually works with parishes throughout our diocese to encourage participation in Public Policy Weekend. Repeatedly, this important event was an opportunity for us to engage Catholics throughout our diocese in efforts to raise their voices in opposition to abortion expansion. As you may imagine, I, along with my colleagues from the Diocesan Catholic Charities Agencies, were disappointed and saddened by the passing of the Reproductive Care Act. The fact that many of our elected officials in our region stood with us in opposition to this legislation provided little consolation. What we witnessed was not celebratory. It was not a win for women's rights, but a devastating blow that further ostracizes and marginalizes the most vulnerable among us. The legislation is, was, in direct contrast to what we hold sacred, and that is the value of life, all life, from conception to natural death. What I believe this legislation has effectively done is erroneously led mothers to believe that there's no other option. The legislation has reinforced, has championed, the message that some lives are just not worth valuing. That, at its very core, is the antithesis of all we believe and all we do at Catholic Charities. In the Gospel of Life, Blessed Pope John Paul II writes that the decisions that go against life often arise from difficult or even tragic situations of profound suffering, loneliness, 
and a total lack of economic prospects, depression, and anxiety. This statement is not made in an attempt to justify, but rather to define the reality of those who seek abortion, to help each of us understand a reality that might not ever be our own. And through this legislation, lawmakers were able to legislate that their reality, the reality of those seeking to terminate pregnancy, has only one solution. In this legislation, lawmakers have capitalized on that profound suffering, the loneliness, the depression, despair, and have created a legislation that suggests the problems can be rectified as if merely an inconvenience with the act of terminating a pregnancy. We, we know the struggling, the suffering, the despair, it doesn't go away, and that's part of the fallacy of this legislation. This legislation recognizes the realities of those considering abortion and preys upon those very vulnerabilities that we at Catholic Charities seek to resolve. Such was the case for a single mom who recently came to Catholic Family Center. Having not been feeling well, she was unaware that she was pregnant. She presented to that agency at 35 weeks pregnant via referral from her OBGYN. In a very short period of time, she went from learning of her pregnancy to facing decisions that would have a lasting impact on her and her unborn child. Alone and without resources to care for a child, the woman inquired about adoption counseling. With humor, honesty, and a level of care that did not include judgment regarding her situation, that woman worked with a pregnancy counselor to determine that adoption, a closed adoption, was the best option for her unborn child. After delivery, the mom decided that she wanted to know a little bit about the adoptive family, a little bit about her baby. And so the adoption plan was amended to provide for ongoing communication, updates, even pictures. This woman presented in a state of uncertainty, and the alternative was presented to her, an alternative that was able to save the life of her unborn child. The reproductive health care legislation affords little or no attention at all to alternatives. Consider the parents who learn of a devastating diagnosis in utero. Proponents of this legislation would want those parents to believe that their only recourse, the humane course of action, if you will, would be the termination of the pregnancy. To the contrary, within our network, Catholic Charities Community Services works tirelessly with hundreds of individuals, children and adults alike, to thrive even amid diagnosis that abortion advocates would suggest render a life not worth living. In my own agency, Catholic Charities of the Finger Lakes, we provide programs and supports to families who have made the decision to adopt. Amid our caseloads are families with children who have profound disabilities, significant medical diagnosis, and other challenges that proponents of abortion expansion would want you to believe are the very reasons the regulation is necessary. Yet, to a fault, each and every one of these families would, you, would tell you that their lives are complete. They've been made whole by the presence of a life others would believe to be without value. Across our network, in response to every tragic condition or level of profound suffering, we have a response. We have a program or a service that will meet people in their reality and provide the necessary support so that abortion is not their only option. While some have challenged that Catholic Charities doesn't do enough to combat the threat of abortion in our communities, the reality is we have totally risen to the task. And we realize that God has seen the suffering of our clients, their struggles, and has put us there to help them choose life. There's Catholic Charities of Wayne County, whose communication classes are helping young, soon-to-be parents express and make sense of all they are experiencing in their pregnancy. The Healthy Families Program in Shimon and Schuyler counties, working to make sure families have food, clothing, shelter, and that parents receive support in developing the skills necessary to nurture their children. This is the case in Steuben County, where support begins prenatal and continues well into early childhood, assisting parents that many would determine unfit to cultivate a loving relationship with their young child, celebrating important developmental milestones along the way and in Livingston County, where the Community of Caring program helps to inform about prenatal development, develop parenting skills, and works to assure that the family has a safe home to love and to parent their child. 
Yes, these are the very circumstances where proponents of the abortion expansion legislation would argue that parents can't or shouldn't be allowed to bring a child into the world. And yet here they are, actively engaged in services that help them and their children thrive. And there's the countless numbers of pregnant and parenting women and men who rely on the food or the network of nutritious food made possible by the efforts of the Food Bank of the Southern Tier. For that program plays a vital role in supporting persons who have said yes to carrying their babies to term. But even amid all of these examples of Catholic Charities programs and of the other pro-life resources that exist in our communities, the challenge remains. How do we develop a culture of life in our communities and beyond? In what way can we as Catholics meaningfully create a culture of life? Well, honestly, I believe what we first must do is own up to, we have, to where we have the created the opportunity for life to be devalued. There is little doubt this legislation, the Abortion Expansion Act, violates our Catholic imperative of respecting life. Anti-abortion efforts are clear-cut, easily regarded as the cornerstone of our pro-life beliefs. And this recent legislation is worthy of our attention and our urgency. However, there are many, many threats to the sanctity, to the dignity of life that far too often we fail to recognize for what they are, or worse, we believe that if we focus our attention upon them, our contempt for abortion will somehow be dampened. That's not the case. We have to realize that this legislation wasn't just a blatant failure on the part of our elected officials. To be sure, their vote sealed the fate of innocent lives that will be lost. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this legislation is indicative of a complacency in the larger social justice arena. When we fail to hold our elected officials accountable for the treatment of immigrants, for refugees and persons fleeing oppression, we fail to create a culture of life. When we urge cuts to social welfare programs, to food stamps, earned income tax credits, Medicaid, we contribute to those very economic struggles, those sufferings, and to the despair that blessed John Paul II recognized as the heart of decisions to end life. Every time we allow our elected officials to vote against the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the outcast, we open the door a little bit wider and invite legislation that goes against the value of the dignity of life. And how do we fix this? I don't think the answer lies with our elected officials. I think the answer lies within each of us. We must continually ask ourselves this one question. Does the action I'm taking, the legislation I'm backing, the candidate I'm voting for, support the life I fought to protect? Supporting a culture of life necessitates that our response as Catholics should be to protect life at every juncture and reaffirm the dignity of all life. Does this action I'm taking, the legislation I'm backing, the candidate I'm voting for, support the life I fought to protect? Until we can answer with a resounding yes, we fail. Thank you. And so once again, I invite uh, Kathleen Gallagher to come to address us concerning matters of Caribbean You thought you were done with me, didn't you? <laughs> First, I just want to say, in terms of what Jean said about potential litigation, that something good might come out of something so evil, I believe something good already has come out of something so evil. You know, I go around the state and I speak about life issues all the time in all eight dioceses of this state. People are awake. People are awake like they've never been awake before about this issue. So that's a good thing. We have to keep them awake and on their toes and engaged and passionate about this issue. 
Um, okay, so I was given three questions that I can address in the next 10 minutes. I'll try to be quicker than that. Um, my first question was, what is your personal response? What has been your personal response to the passage of this law? Again, as I said, I go around the state and talk about life issues all the time. I talk to diocesan conferences, to parishes, to confirmation classes, faith formation seminaries, talk all the time. But I have to say that I was very timid about talking to my own pastor. And I adore my pastor. He's a wonderful preacher. He connects with young people like no priest I've ever seen before. He's wonderful. Every, every weekend when I go to Mass, he feeds my soul. But I don't think I've ever heard him talk about pro-life issues. So I wrote him an email. <laughs> I didn't bash him over the head. I wrote him an email. I stroked him up front. I told him how wonderful a preacher, how gifted a child of God he is, because he truly is in breaking open the gospel for people and connecting with youth. And then I said, but kind of drives me a little bonkers that I've never heard you utter a pro-life word from the pulpit. And I gave him a few suggestions on how to do that in the prayers of the faithful to incorporate a prayer each weekend for life, born and unborn. Um, I gave him some suggestions on things the parish might do. I gave, him, I gave him, I thought, some concrete ideas about how he can plant the seeds in the parishioners' minds about how we all have a moral responsibility to build a culture of life. And I was kind of afraid to click send, <laughs> but I did. And I have to tell you, it has opened up a wonderful dialogue. Um, you know, he, he kind of owned up to it, and he said, you're right. I've been afraid, I've been hesitant, because there's a lot of things driving people away from the Catholic Church, and I didn't want to give them one more reason to run away. But he owned up to it, and he said, let's talk about this. Let's start a committee at our parish. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> so I feel really good about the conversation that we had and the ongoing dialogue that we're having in this new subcommittee that's been formed at my parish. And I want to encourage all of you that if you're feeling the same way about your parish or your pastor, your priest, don't beat him over the head. Don't yell at him. Don't take a baseball bat to him. <laughs> try the gentle approach. You know, Try stroking him and affirming him for what he does and opening up a dialogue. Certainly in my case, it's worked, and I'm, I'm happy about that. The second question I have to address is, what is the one thing you want people to know about abortion that is not commonly understood? Well, I want to tell you that despite the fact that Planned Parenthood and the abortion activists seem to have gotten everything they wanted in the Reproductive Health Act, they still left a couple of pro-life laws on our books. I find that hard to believe, but they did. There are a couple of pro-life laws I just wanted to educate you about if you don't know. In our civil rights law, we have very strong protection for medical personnel who do not wish to be involved in the performance of an abortion or the assistance in the performance of an abortion. Very strong civil rights protection that has been upheld. Two nurses at Albany Medical Center back in the 90s were terminated for their positions, and they sued under this law. And they lost in the lower court, and then when it was appealed, they appealed it to the appellate division. Albany Medical Center backed down and gave them a nice big settlement, because they knew they were going to lose. We have very strong civil rights and human rights law protection on the books. All the medical personnel have to do is file a form a simple letter with their employer to say, I do not wish to be involved in the performance or assistance with abortion, and they are protected. And there are civil and criminal penalties that will apply to any employers who discriminate against employees with these strong reservations about abortion. So that's something I think we need to get out there and advertise to our friends who are in the medical field. I don't know how the Reproductive Health Act might interplay with that at some time down the road, but right now, there's very strong protection on our books. 
The second law I wanted to tell you about, and again, I'm stunned that the pro-choice folks didn't take this off the books. Um, we have a section of our public health law that continues to require that a fetal death certificate be filed for every death of an unborn child in New York State. Whether that is a spontaneous fetal death, a miscarriage or a stillbirth, or whether that is an induced abortion. I have a copy right here with me, and it is called Certificate of Fetal Death. Someone has died. This is the evidence that someone has died. Again, it's a great educational tool that I think we need to use with people. There's a certificate of death. It is not a part of the woman's body. <laughs> New York State requires this. Okay. And my last question was, what are some local practical means that we can generate a culture of life? I thought I should talk a little bit about public policy since that's my thing. Um, but in terms of public policy, I'm afraid to say there's little to nothing that we can do in the current political climate that is Albany land uh, these days. Um, there, there's no way that in the near future we're going to be able to repeal this law or even fix this law in the parts that are gravely awful. Although, shout out to Senator Pam Helming, who has introduced a bill to put back into our law the born alive in infant protections for babies who are accidentally born alive. Um, so it's good that that's there and that she's making that statement. I just don't want people to have unrealistic expectations that these bills are going to go anywhere in this particular climate, because they're not. But I do think we have to hold our lawmakers accountable as citizens of New York State. If your lawmakers, your state senator and assembly person, voted no on this horrific law, you need to thank them. Pro-life lawmakers, take it from me, they don't get a lot of thanks. They get beat up a lot, but they don't get a lot of thanks. They need to be affirmed. They need to be thanked. Um, and if your state assembly person voted yes on this horrific law, you need to hold them accountable. And you need to let them know how gravely disappointed, heartbroken, upset, outraged you are that they would vote for this law that went way beyond Roe versus Wade. And after you do it once, you should do it again. And when they come to speak at the local Knights of Columbus Hall, you should go there, raise your hand at the end, and let them know again how disappointed you are. Because the next election doesn't happen for these state senators and assembly people until November of 2020. And they're counting on the thing that they think their constituents are going to forget. We can't forget. We have to hold them accountable. You can communicate with your lawmakers through our website, nyscatholic.org. NYScatholic.org. It's a very simple way, efficient way of communicating with your lawmakers. I encourage you to do that. Um, and finally, I think we have to help our Catholic people connect their pro life beliefs, their faith, with their politics. I think too often today, People compartmentalize their lives, right? My family life is over here, my work life is over here, my faith is over here, my politics are over here. No! Our faith is supposed to color everything we do. When we go into the voting booth, we don't conveniently leave Jesus outside. <laughs> he comes in with us. And so we have to know, we have to form our conscience in the way that the Catholic Church tells us to inform our conscience. And yes, we have to consider a wide variety of issues when we vote, but there's a priority scale. And some issues are black and white and absolute. And the taking of innocent human life is one of them. It's evil. And we have to hold our lawmakers accountable. Thank you.
Jewish guy who's not working too well. I, I do apologize for that. Uh, if anyone would care to donate, some of money, so that we might have to take care of them. I'd be more than happy to receive your funds. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Dr. Alicia uh, Speech. Uh, she's a local board certified family physician and an Afro technology medical consultant. She's affiliated with MyCatholicDoctor.com, a new Catholic telehealth organization. Dr. Speech is also the past president of the Finger Lakes Guild of the Catholic Medical Association. Please welcome Dr. Speech. that is similar to the Reproductive Health Act. Things like writing letters and a couple of articles and getting together with other doctors, both in Albany and locally, to lobby against the passage of a law that would so negatively impact my patients. And so, like many of you, I was deeply saddened and really outraged as a woman, as a mother, and particularly as a physician, when I realized that Governor Cuomo, due to po partisan politics, was finally going to be able to push through his radically pro-abortion agenda in the form of the Reproductive Health Act. So from my perspective as a family physician, the REJ harms not just one, but two of my patients, being 100% fatal for one of them and posing significant medical risks for the other. Am I good here, like, with this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To counter the effects of the RHA, we must know the facts about late-term abortion. Tonight, the main points that I will be addressing from a medical standpoint are that one, late-term abortion is never necessary for a woman's health, and two, that it has significant risk of serious harm, both immediate and long-term, to the mother. So late-term abortion is an inexact medical term, really, but it generally means abortion in the third trimester or even the late second trimester. And so this qualifies for the part of the pregnancy that is affected by the Reproductive Health Act, meaning greater than the baby is greater than 24 weeks, at which point that baby is viable, which means able to live outside the mother's womb, even though he or she may need medical assistance. So first, we need to be clear that late-term abortion is unnecessary for women's health. Many abortion advocates cite grave medical conditions affecting the health and life of the mother as reasons to justify abortion. But many OBGYNs disagree based on their training and experience. The American Association of Pro-Life Obstetrician and Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or APLOG, states that these conditions are actually extremely rare, particularly before viability of the baby. Dr. Mary Davenport, the past president of APLOG, argues that with any serious maternal health problem after viability, both the mother and the baby can be saved by inducing labor or performing a cesarean section. There is no need to intentionally kill the baby. She goes on to say that earlier in the pregnancy, chemotherapy or radiation treatments can be postponed until viability, or the mother can opt for a schedule of treatment that is better tolerated by the baby. Dr. Thomas Goodwin, a respected maternal fetal specialist at the University of Southern California, says that often women are needlessly referred for abortion, typically from a doctor's lack of knowledge or inexperience in treating women with these high-risk pregnancies. And he has presented several cases in which pregnant women with heart conditions, cancer, or severe kidney or autoimmune disease 
have been told they've had to have an abortion to save their life or health. But in each case, they were either given the wrong diagnosis or incomplete information or not presented with any alternatives to an abortion. He cites the case of a 38-year-old woman with lymph node positive breast cancer who was told she had to have an abortion prior to receiving chemotherapy. She ended up with a healthy baby boy after receiving a second opinion that the chemotherapy required for her condition was actually very unlikely to have any ill effects on the baby. And sadly, when her first doctor was informed of her wish to continue with the pregnancy, he requested that the second doctor, who gave the second opinion, assume her care and then accept any possible liability. And that brings us to another interesting and important point. Doctors face severe legal penalties for what is known as wrongful birth if they fail to inform parents-to-be of all possible risks or complications of pregnancy and then the parents later decide that they would have had an abortion if only they had realized their child might have like that particular condition. However, there is apparently no corresponding legal penalty for wrongful abortion. And so you can see it becomes less risky for the doctor to recommend abortion than to foresee and discuss all possible complications and life-threatening alternatives to abortion. Now, as you know, grave fetal conditions are also cited as reasons for abortions. And so prenatal ultrasounds are routinely done at 18 to 20 weeks. So by this time, a subsequent abortion would already be considered late term. But imaging techniques are not always perfect. And sometimes women who have been diagnosed with fatal birth, with babies with fatal birth defects, and who decline abortion, end up having normal babies. Now, and this is really an important point, if by ultrasound or prenatal genetic testing, the baby is found to have a diagnosis that is incompatible with life, or if the mother does happen to have a very rare life-threatening medical condition before the baby becomes viable, the most humane and compassionate care for both of them is provided by delivering an intact child and then providing palliative and comfort care as well as support to the parents and family, ideally through a perinatal hospice program. This allows grieving and closure and honors the baby, which in turn protects parents from latent guilt, regret, and even frank psychopathology, which is well documented in women who have had abortions. Now I do want to point out that the most common reason for late abortion is not a serious medical condition of either the mother or the baby, but rather it is delayed diagnosis of pregnancy, or other reasons that are similar to those given for early abortions, relationship problems, young or old maternal age, financial concerns, educational concerns. And despite claims that late-term abortion is rare, comprising 1.3% of all abortions, that is still over 11,000 fetal pain-capable human beings that are being killed each year. In 2016, New York State alone had over 1,700 abortions performed after 20 weeks. And so I just want to say too that pain-capable, the current thinking is that it's after 20 weeks, but there are studies out there to show that even before that, they are thinking that there is definitely evidence that the that the baby can respond to painful stimuli. So, so we've covered my first point, why late-term abortion is not necessary. And now I want to make my second main point, which is that late-term abortion is harmful to women with both immediate and long-term risks to life and health. The risk of hemorrhage, massive bleeding, infection, like widespread sepsis, and uterine perforation during and after abortion all increase the later in pregnancy that it is performed. Interestingly, my, my daughter just told me about another young woman she knows who just had an abortion and ended up with widespread sepsis and having to have a total hysterectomy. This is just, she just happened to mention it after I was telling her about my talk. And anyway, incredibly, the risk of maternal mortality from abortion, this is amazing, rises by 38% each week 
past the eighth week of a pregnancy. 38% each week past the eighth week. Also, in later pregnancy, abortions may take up to two to three days and can be complicated. So Dr. Tony Levitino, who Kathy Gallagher actually referenced um, when she was first speaking, he is an OBGYN that previously performed abortions. He has said that it is much quicker and safer to perform a C-section in controlled medical conditions, particularly in an emergency, than to perform a time-consuming and complicated abortion. Now, other long-terms to the mother, long-term harms to the mother include well-documented increases in psychopathology. And by that, I mean things like substance use and abuse, depression, anxiety, suicidal behaviors, victims of domestic violence. And this does not even cover general feelings of regret, loss, and guilt in women who don't even have a formal psychiatric diagnosis. It is also now clear that there is a link, a clear link between surgical abortions and subsequent very preterm births. This risk rises with the number of abortions that a woman has had. And all of these risks are, of course, compounded by the fact that after the passage of the Reproductive Health Act, abortions can now be done by non-physicians, which was mentioned. And they have a vastly different level of training and experience. And we can always talk about that in the Q&A if anyone is interested. And finally, I want to address the often heard claim that it's safer to have an abortion than it is to go through a live birth. Probably many of you have heard that. I know the statistic I've heard quoted is that it is 14 times riskier to have a baby than it is to have an abortion. So I want you to know that it is actually impossible to make that comparison because the Center for Disease Control and state health clinics receive reports that drastically underrepresent abortion-related deaths. And the reasons for this are, one, that abortion reporting is not required under federal law, and many states do not report abortion-related deaths to the CDC. In fact, only 27 of our states do so. It's been estimated that over half of the abortions, half of abortions are done in those states that don't report. The second thing is, is that deaths resulting from complications of abortion are reported on the death certificate as due to the complication itself, like sepsis or hemorrhage, rather than to the abortion. Similar to this is the fact that since mostly women leave the abortion facility pretty quickly afterwards, any later complications will be seen not by the abortion provider, but they will be seen in the emergency room. And then so subsequent deaths there will also be related to the complication, not to the abortion. And finally, we know that um, there is definitely uh, increased suicide statistics among women who have had abortions, and those deaths are rarely, if ever, linked back to previous abortions. So I hope you can see how underrepresented abortion-related deaths really are. So don't let anyone tell you that it's safer to have an abortion than a baby. So in summary, um, in the wake of the Reproductive Health Act, we really must arm ourselves with the knowledge of one, why this legislation was and is so unnecessary, and two, why it is harmful to women's health so that we can inform others, our patients, friends, colleagues, and for some of us, the general public. Um, improving access to pro-life OBGYNs and maternal fetal specialists, and improving access to and development, uh, development of perinatal hospice programs will all help to counteract the effect of the RHA. But I really believe that education and awareness will be the cornerstone of moving forward in a life-affirming way. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Susan Stack. Uh, since 2014, Susan has acted as the Life Issues Coordinator for Catholic Charities and Roman Catholic Diocese of Rochester. She's a native of Rochester and has worked in parish ministry in the diocese for more than a decade. She holds a master degree in theology from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., and a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Buffalo State College. 
currently studying for her Master of Divinity degree right here at St. Mary's. Among her many ministries, Suzanne has been involved with Focus Pregnancy Help Center in Rochester, and is active in Feminists for Nonviolent Choices of New York. She annually participates in the 40 Days for Life campaign, as well as in New York State Catholic Conference meetings for state legislatures to educate them about and advocate for Catholic teachings on life issues. And Suzanne is a great laugh. All right, and let's welcome Suzanne. All right, I have to make one minor correction. Um, unfortunately, he used an outdated bio that I only updated like seconds before this started, so it's not his fault. <laughs> But um, I worked 10 years for my uh, Master of Divinity degree here, and I did get it last May. So. <laughs> um, and uh, one other thing, too, I know that um, uh, Kathy mentioned, you know, the legislators, what, who, how they voted, and how you can be aware. Well, um, Bishop McConnell was one of the first to note that only two, only two, legislators in this diocese, state legislators in this diocese voted um, against, the, I mean in favor of the RHA. Everybody else voted against it, um, which does give you a sense of uh, how our diocese works. But the only two who voted for it is my assemblywoman, <laughs> Jamie Romeo. Uh, she covers uh, the city under Rhonda Quite and, and um, Brighton, I don't know if all of it or anything, but anyway. And the other one is uh, Harry Bronson, and he covers the city as well as uh, Gates and uh, parts of Chi Lai. Um, so if uh, you don't live in those areas and don't have an assembly member, you should thank your legislator. And those of you who do live in uh, uh, the districts uh, that, have, uh, that Harry Bronson and Jamie Romeo cover can let them know what you think uh, and how disappointed you are. And of course, I was deeply saddened and frustrated. You know, I even though I've only been in this position as life issues coordinator for five years, I've been involved in that battle for 12 years as we kept, you know, holding it off and holding it off and holding it off. Um, you know, there were there were, you know, when it was tied with this whole, you know, 10 point women's agenda. Um, and uh, the governor was determined that it wasn't going to pass without all of it. Well, you know, they, they forfeited the rest of those points for abortion for three years until they finally caved and let it go um, without the abortion provision. And, you know, sadly, as, you know, politics go, um, we knew that, you know, with, as, uh, with the way things fell in that election, that, uh, that we weren't going to be able to hold it off any longer. Not that that meant we shouldn't let our legislation know how we feel. And it is quite the wake-up call for Catholics. From this diocese, 4,386 emails were sent to our state legislators and governor opposing the passage of the Reproductive Health Act. 66% of those people had never been part of the Catholic Action Network for the um, New York State Catholic Conference before. So they're new to this whole thing. And that's exciting because that's a whole group of people that is now energized. And of course, both the bishop and I have heard, you know, especially the bishop has gotten quite a few anguished letters and phone calls saying, how can this happen? How did we let this happen? What do we do now? And of course, this forum is part of the result of that, recognizing that, yes, we can do something. We are not powerless in the face of, you know, uh, pink lights uh, going off in celebration of death. So we have opportunities. And you know, one thing I have to say that surprised me was, um, for, even from a national perspective, my sister sent me, um, she follows Ben Shapiro, and so she sent me some comments on the RHA that were um, posted on his uh, 
Facebook. And so many people were shocked that anyone could pass such legislation for late-term abortion. And I'm like, apparently they don't know that Roe v. Wade already allows this. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that, maybe that's a good thing. We didn't know how bad it was. Um, and, uh, and, and I know that that's true of many of the people that have contacted the diocese as well. Is, so we didn't realize how, you know, even though it goes much farther than codifying Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade does allow for late-term abortion. And, um, and I think it, it shows that people didn't realize that we were really capable of, of this much. And, and of this much harm to mothers just as much as, of course, the infants who died in such abortions. And so that's important that we can do that. The other thing I have to say that, that um, I have realized more through this and through people's response is that people maybe didn't really understand the violence of abortion or didn't see it as violence. And that's one great thing that Father Jim Hughes, who is here, always does in Project Rachel trainings for those who would like to be involved in the ministry of, of Project Rachel or even understand the heart of you know, women who are post-aborted is the violence angle to show how violent abortion is, just, just along with any other violence. And so that's so key for us to realize. And I think this recent film, Unplanned, that came out really does give a realistic picture of that violence. And again, not just to the, the child in the womb, which of course is absolute, but to the mother as well. I mean, they show that um, Abby Johnson had a horrible medical abortion and was in agony for 72 hours of, of labor expelling um, the fetus. And it was just horrendous. And you know, that I think people didn't realize and that it really is, you know, they didn't, they gave a real sick portrayal. They weren't trying to be, I don't think it was unnecessarily gruesome, but it just helps you get the reality. And of course, you suffer those consequences all by yourself unless you happen to get to an emergency room. But in her case, she suffered all this on her bathroom floor. So, um, so you know, one thing we can do is, you know, the, um, the bishops have even encouraged this, that that, uh, that that film can be shown, you know, everywhere and anywhere as it, as it comes out to, to the public. Um, and especially, of course, to younger generations and women of childbearing age. And, you know, Bishop Matano expressed his disappointment and our response in, in both February and May letters in the Courier. Um, he's really spent a lot of time on this, or you know, like the um, paragraphs in these letters to um, point out that we indeed need to be there for anyone who is struggling with an unexpected pregnancy. We need to do this in our parishes, we need to do this individually, we need to do this as a diocese. And that is something, as Ellen pointed out, that Catholic Charities does all the time. So that's something that is my phone. Thank you. Um, and uh, so, and we have pregnancy resource centers available in close pregnant, close proximity in almost every single area of our diocese. A volunteer is currently matching up nearby pregnancy centers for every parish in the diocese. And uh, we'll be getting that out along with Project Rachel information and Elizabeth Ministry, which isn't as known to people. But it was started by women who um, suffered a miscarriage or stillbirth or infant loss, and they now offer bereavement ministry to other, others in that situation. And, uh, so parishes can have this information in their bulletins, and they can offer practical support. This event, of course, is part of the need to educate ourselves, and parishes can do similar events. And even this event, it's, um, it's being live streamed right now on YouTube and on Facebook, and it's also being videotaped so that it can be utilized in other venues. And that's a wonderful opportunity that we have. We can each keep current and respond to legislative issues and 
Kathy talked a little bit about that, by getting on the Catholic Action Network, and that you will find on the New York State Catholic Conference. And that way you'll get emails about, you can, there's a list, um, or if you do an email, you'll see the same list of uh, opportunities that you have to check off issues that you're interested in, and, and you'll get an alert saying, okay, here's an issue to uh, email your legislators about. And they make it easy, it is editable, so you can put in your own personal perspective, which I usually do, um, and uh, so that really makes a difference. And I'm seeing, which I'm very excited about, uh, new Respect Life committees being formed in uh, parishes that, you know, really, they have indeed woken a sleeping giant, and that is, you know, is, as uh, some have mentioned, that we maybe were too complacent, and now people are recognizing what is really at stake, and so um, pastors or lay people, whoever, are getting the courage and conviction to say, wow, we need to make a difference here in, in our parish, in our, in our town, in our region, in, in our public policy. And this is such a great opportunity to do that. Well, you know, it's right in people's faces and, and the motivation is high. So while the Reproductive Act counts abortion as a fundamental right, it's our job to reiterate strongly, broadly expressing in word and deed the fundamental dignity of every single human life at every stage from the moment of conception to natural death. Thank you. speakers for what they have shared with us tonight. And I think it would be um, a really good use of our time if we were to take this advantage and to uh, maybe ask questions, uh, maybe enter into discussion with uh, the various people who have presented um, on any particular issues that you would like. Uh, to do this, um, uh, Dr. Kuhner, my new dean, um, will actually go around with the microphone and uh, give it to you. And uh, I'll be able to pass the microphone to the people here uh, at, the, um, uh, at the front, and uh, we'll, we'll engage accordingly. And so, Matthew. Uh, this is for Kathy Gallagher. One of the reasons I came, um, you talked about a fundamental right. I've heard nobody say anything about this, nothing written anywhere. The Reproductive Health Act, this is what it says. This is the text. Every individual who becomes pregnant has the fundamental right to choose to carry the pregnancy to term to give birth to a child or to have an abortion. Choose to carry the pregnancy to term or to give birth to a child. Why don't we hold the legislators to the fire for that? It's not just about abortion, it's saying they have a right. The Guttmacher Institute, which is suspicious, but says 75% of women that have abortions are because of low income or poor. The people I've seen for 20 years in Project Rachel felt alone, unsupported. Why aren't we holding them, the legislators, their legislation says, has a fundamental right to carry the child to birth? Yes, that's absolutely true. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately because right now in New York State, abortion is pretty much free. It's cost free. Medicaid will pay for abortion for anyone who's Medicaid eligible. And as of last summer, Governor Cuomo, without the accountability of the legislature, enacted new regulations that say all health insurance plans must cover abortion without co-pays. So for anybody with health insurance or Medicaid, abortions are virtually cost-free in New York State. I will say that the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany and others are litigating that. They have sued in court and that lawsuit is ongoing. However, it's been bugging me what you just said, Father, about um, how it says we have a fundamental, women have a fundamental right to choose to give birth. 
Well, shouldn't that be free too? Maybe we should introduce some legislation that says maternity stays in the hospital have to be co-payment co free. No, no payment for that, right? Don't you think? So I'm thinking about going to some friendly legislators and seeing if we can get that introduced. But thank you for that, because that is a very good point you make. And not just birth, but to whatever it needs to care, it says to carry the child to birth, whatever that woman needs. An unsupported pregnancy, whatever it needs, that woman should have it. That's what the law says. Right. Well, we do have the prenatal care assistance program in New York State, which we did help enact, and I'm very proud of that, um, which does provide women, I think it's up to 250% of the poverty level, um, you might know better than me, Ellen, but they get their prenatal vitamins and their monthly visits with their obstetricians, et cetera, all covered under the prenatal care assistance program. Well, what if they need housing? Yeah. Food, whatever yeah. they need to carry that child to birth. They yes. shouldn't be left off the hook. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for um, for this evening. I, I'm a staff writer for the National Catholic Register, uh, and I've been Peter Jester Smith, so I live here. Um, but I've been reporting on this issue for, you know, gosh, I think it has, has to be what six years since we've been talking about this Catholic year, something like that. the The problem that I the the problem that I identify is that it feels like we're still fighting the last war. Education, awareness, and we still lose. One of the things that I thought we should probably have thought about, let, let's rephrase what's happened here. The Reproductive Health Act is a finishing blow of a massive crisis we've had already, in which the final touches have been put on. And yes, they could still go even further. But first trimester abortion is 90 to 92 percent of all the victims of abortion. And right now, there's no way we can legally touch that. Why aren't we creatively pursuing the other ways to address that? And I've been able to report on a lot of creativity in the pro-life movement to try to do that very thing, particularly through new alternatives to Planned Parenthood, such as Gianna Centers, Obria Centers, Guiding Star facilities. I've reported on all of this. All these things, all these things have been developed, recognizing that there are certain things that Planned Parenthood has done very well in creating this business of this culture of death that they profit from. They recognize the statistics of where their customers come from. The fact that 75% of them are low income. 50% of women who get abortions are making a, a poverty, federal poverty wage. It's about 16,000 a year. That's who the customer base is. That's the reality of the situations. How do we creatively change that in order to flip around this question? Because so long as it's going to be about 30% of women, approximately that, that number, who have abortions, and then all of it's those associates all, all of those in, within their circle who know those stories, there is no way we are going to tip the balance of this country between 50-50 pro-life and pro-choice or abortion. And I guess that's a question that I have for you today is how are we thinking about challenging this status quo? Because right now, I know for the history of this diocese, the Catholic Church retreated from the city, closing parishes, pulling out, and it's ensconced itself in the suburbs. Now I think that's a tragedy and there are historical reasons for why that happened. But it doesn't have to be our future. So what are creative ways we can get our parishes to engage creatively in the cities, in the center city, to work with Father Mogavero, who's been an exemplary pro-life priest who knows what the social justice teachings are, that they go together. And I think that's kind of where I would appreciate a little bit more dialogue. We have Catholic Charities, it's doing great work. Is it up to scale? Are people being challenged to be generous enough or are we outsourcing the responsibility for the poor to a lobbyist, to a petition, 
to Catholic charities, Pope Francis says we have this has to touch us personally. That that's how we are going to meet Christ. And so I guess that's the challenge that I have for you. How are we going to do this differently? How are we going to rethink this, understanding where people are at? How do we change those dynamics on the ground, given that the legislative option has been closed off to us? Well, I'll attempt that. Um, I guess a couple things. Um, I think our, our diocese thrives across the entire diocese, not just in the suburbs, um, small cities, large cities. And um, what we at Catholic Charities try to do is develop those relationships with our parishes so that instead of being in situations where we can cite statistics that the majority of, of abortions take place in, with of women who are low income, we try to address those societal structures that force people to be living in poverty in the first place. That's where some of our complacency has come in. We, we don't do enough aggressively to address issues like living wage and um, developing competencies and capabilities for persons to move beyond poverty so that their circumstances are no longer defining their choices, so that they have opportunities, regardless of where they may be situated across our, our diocesan structure. I agree, it does require a degree of creativity in terms of how we backdoor our way in to address this legislation, but the you know, we can, we can as charities respond with charity, or we can collectively move the needle on issues of justice. And that's, I think, what my message was intended to impart, that we've, we've, we've just kind of let enough social justice concerns go by the wayside that it's kind of forced the hands on many of the people who are, are, are turning to abortions for, for, you know, decisions. And that's, that's where I think we've got to become a little bit more aggressive in terms of uh, fighting this fight. You know, we just can't say it's, it's all or nothing. We have to pretty much address all of those collective issues. That's, that's my take on that. Suzanne? Um, I appreciate the point, Peter. I, I think it's well made and certainly is going to stay with us so that we can creatively think about that. Um, what your point made me think about was a woman from this diocese, Mary Dwelly, Mary Dwelly, Mary Dwelly was a member of Feminist Choosing Life of New York. This woman embodied the gospel of life. She was the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. I went to her funeral, which was at an inner city parish here in the Rochester Diocese. I can't remember which parish it was. St. St. Bridget's. Oh my gosh. I still get goosebumps thinking about it because the, the uh, celebrant asked the, the crowd if anybody wanted to stand up and say something about Mary. And one by one, people stood up and said things like, when I broke my leg, Mary walked up three flights of stairs every week to do my laundry. When I was homeless on the street, Mary had blankets and food in her trunk and she gave them to me. It was like Mary was pro-life to her core. And maybe that's the lesson that all of us have to take away from tonight, you know, that that's what we're called to be. I would like to see that. I would like to see an awareness that we must be of the Mary, the Christ, whoever, to all these people that need to be helped and to have our parishes work together with our communities, with Catholic charities to say, what do we, how do we want to envision the help that we're going to give our neighbor, that we're going to help this Christ to need and this Christ to need and realize that the pro-life and social justice issues are not separate, they're interconnected, and they feed into each other. And to stop this stupid division between pro-life and social justice, which has been enormously destructive to the Catholic witness. And I know this very well because my own family has witnessed it. My mother was involved very much in the Catholic worker movement, and she very much understood how they went together. And it was awful to see them being ripped apart as if somehow they could be separated. But if we can realize this, seek Christ, who is that, and get our parishes to actually engage our people in meeting him, 
not in an abstract way, not outsourcing it just to Catholic charities, but to work closely with Catholic charities, to work closely with the community, to figure out what the needs are. I want to see a Gianna Center. I want to see some clinic that is dedicated to serving women and is funded by private philanthropy so that they can go there and are respected and loved and treated well. And if they end up in crisis, they can go there and are served. And they don't end up like 13% of Planned Parenthood's cl clients that go there for one service and end up with abortion. Why can't we fund and provide an alternative? I would like to see every maternity center and crisis pregnancy center that's helping these women look tip-top shape and not look underfunded. And I would like to see more of them than the three or four that I saw in this Rochester area. We, we have, have, have people doing yeoman's work with not enough resources, with not enough personal investment. And that is an equation I would like to see us change. And I hope that tonight can be just part of the journey at the beginning to really making an effort to bring about an invested local and personalist response. So thank you so much for having this forum. I would just love it if, if um, the Archbishop Timothy Dolan and all the bishops put their heads Cardinal. together. Card Cardinal, Cardinal, sorry. <laughs> and uh, excommunicate these people that support abortion, you know, Nancy Pelosi, any, anybody that's in government, to make a big ruckus uh, with the media and, and uh, ex you know, just kick them out of the church if they're Roman Catholic because it seems as if the bishops are too quiet about it and, you know, they might have political inclinations and they might be friends with some of these people, but I think that there's a lot of silence in, in, our, in our church, in the Christian church, and, and it's, um, it's puzzling and it's, it's uh, you know, it's saddening, really. And, and I don't know why they won't speak up and, and uh, just shout out about it, go on to the networks and, and uh, talk about talk about this and and I guess that they're already excommunicated if they're if they're um, supporting abortion but it's a silent it's silent and they don't come out and talk about it um, so that's just puzzles me you know. I guess I just want to piggyback on that a little bit and I, I'm, I don't want to sound too negative but um, Kathy was it you who talked about Bishop and letters and communication, yeah. Um, you know, I'm an educated person. I listen to the news all the time. I think I'm aware of what's going on. I had, I go to church every week, more than every week. In my parish, we didn't hear a thing about this. I, I saw, the, the first thing I knew was when I saw those women smiling around the governor and that law had passed and I was shocked. I was like, why haven't we been hearing about this for weeks? Why haven't we had petitions? Why haven't, why were we not inundated with information? And maybe some parishes were, but I think the diocese, whoever, somebody needs to do more so that every parish in the diocese knows about these things, not after it's happened, before, so we can try to do something. Every parish in the diocese does get informed in terms of the, the parish staff. Now, where it goes from there is up to them. And so if you're frustrated with what's happening in your parish, Again, you don't want to bash your, your pastor because that's not going to help. But it, 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 it just, you want to bring these concerns and say, hey, I'm glad to help with this. And, you know, this is what I'd like to see. So, you know, I mean, hey, it works for Kathy. <laughs> well, we need to invite people. I think if, if you can't find a conduit through your parish, you can reach out to the Catholic Charities Network and we can link you with Justice and Peace Committees and the Diocesan Public Policy Committee and 
and other like groups throughout our throughout our diocese. We don't want to market at can Catholic charities, but there are a, a lot of groups that are working on these issues. And then perhaps you or those who felt like they were uninformed as this was moving forward can be that source of information in your own parish community. I just want to say that um, someplace uh, in this room there is a um, um, hundred ideas of what you can do either in your parish or what we can do as a diocese or what you can do as an individual. Um, most of that was put together by Father Jim Hughes, but it was also, um, there were other people that input into that uh, quite a long time ago. Um, and so um, maybe you can pick that up when you leave because I think that if we're able to, even with whatever group we're in, whatever parish we're in, be able to do one or two of those things, it'll start to be felt. Um, because to create a culture is extremely difficult. And it takes a long time. But you start with what you have. And you do what's important now. And little by little, it'll grow. So I hope that you'll pick one of those up. Father Tony, we'll pass that out uh, in a few minutes here. Okay, yeah. And speaking of that, um, as uh, Dr. Laughlin mentioned, there have been um, meetings within uh, the diocese of different departments getting together and talking about how we can be on the same page and, and be in communication and be reaching out in each of these departments. And I can tell you that um, uh, Father Jim uh, Hughes met with myself and Jack Belinsky, the uh, Director of Catholic Charities, uh, before that started. And so some of those hundred ideas have been incorporated in, in some of the uh, outreach that we're looking to do within our diocesan department. So um, it, is, it, is, it is beginning to happen, and it's exciting that the bishop has called together, you know, all of us, to be a part of this. It's not just a, you know, one office deal. So, it's great. Okay, if I may, I want to thank Peter for your passion. Um, and if everybody wants to think about something that they really can do right now or tomorrow that will make a direct impact on the pro-life movement, right now the Women's Care Center at 3252 Lake Avenue, which is a local crisis pregnancy center, is out of size one, size five, and size six diapers. We're out of wipes, and we're really low on baby formula. So we are the front lines. We are working super hard. We do not get any kind of support aside from, as Holly Harvey would say, God's uh, economy of grace. And we are very grateful to God, and we'd be very grateful to everybody here if you want to come bring a pack of diapers or some baby clothes or whatever. What is your Where's name that? and address again? Um, my name is Gretchen Gillespie, I and I know the Women's Care Center, 3252 Lake Avenue, up in Shalott. We take care of between 100 and 120 families a month. So, and it's all volunteer. We're all volunteers who work there. We get everything by donation. When it comes in, it immediately goes out. We've seen tons of miracles. If you want to come visit us, we're open Wednesdays and Fridays from 1 to 4. Um, you're welcome to come check us out, come visit, come lend a hand if you want, or just stop in and say hi. Um, when our clients come in, we find out where they live, we look up what parish is near them, we've sent millions of them over, to, not literally millions, but lots to Father Tony and to St. Michael's, um, to Father Mickey McGrath, and so forth. There is a big lack of parishes in our inner city, as Peter pointed out, but you know, we do, like, we work hard to figure out how these women can get to a church, whether it's the bus line or if they have friends, and you know, hopefully we're making a little difference. And I told Father White one day that if 10% of the ladies that we sent to different parishes took us up on it, they'd have to open up a lot of those closed churches. So anyway, thank you. I would just like to emphasize with that too, is to work with the pregnancy centers to make sure that there's intake. Like if they do send somebody to church, that somebody's looking out for them, so that these people are really part of our communities. That's an area of Catholic witness and welcome I think is created and which we should do. So thank you so much for the idea. Um, 
I'll be in touch with you. Yeah, we'll talk okay. to you. Um, as we're talking about tangible, concrete ways we can um, truly make a difference. So like many of you, when, um, and as you spoke about, uh, many of you up there, when the RHA was passed, I was, you know, there was a fire lit under me, and I was wondering, what can I do? And that's when I actually heard about um, a local group called, called Sidewalk Advocates for Life. Um, some of you may have actually seen um, the Unplanned movie, and uh, you would have seen um, sidewalk counselors or sidewalk advocates reaching out in love and care to the women going into Planned Parenthood or abortion clinics. And we actually have a group um, right here in Rochester who does that. Um, we believe that there shouldn't be an hour that Planned Parenthood is open where someone isn't out on the sidewalk reaching out with alternatives and love and prayer. Um, and there's actually a schedule up. Um, actually, Jim actually has a table back there. If anyone is interested in knowing more, um, he does trainings. So if you, um, it's on your heart to um, receive training to be an advocate, to reach out in love, you can do that. Or we have prayer partners on the sidewalk that are that is essential um, to this ministry. I've only been involved for a few months, and I've already seen such fruits from it. Um, in fact, uh, Planned Parenthood's own statistics say that when someone, when people are out praying peacefully on the sidewalks, that no-show rate, which is normally 25%, can jump as high as 75%. So we, um, wow. <laughs> It's huge, and then we will um, give them other options. We will send them to places that truly will care for them and give them what they need. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to um, go back there at the table and um, check it out. I'd also like to have my own voice of support with regard to the good work that uh, Mention Havens does. If you really want some good practical real advice about how to do good work here, he's right there. Go and talk. And his um, show is Tuesday at 4 o'clock. And his show is Tuesday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I just wanted to mention there are a few people in the audience here, including Father Tony, um, who were involved in the Rochester Education Committee for Right to Life many years ago. And in this small committee, uh, we, we, tried to, we tried to educate through the parishes and through the schools. And at that time, and it probably still existing, Planned Parenthood was going into the schools and giving out their literature. We asked for equal time, or we would have parents request equal time, and they would invite us in. It was not always easy following Planned Parenthood, but when you have facts and we're talking about the humanity of the unborn, and at that time we had a slide projector and showing the pictures, the students in the class saw what was real, and we would actually go through um, different organizations, even in uh, some of the confirmation classes I can remember doing. Um, I think maybe that's a place we've omitted within our parishes. We have sacramental programs. I know at one point I met a woman and she told me that her daughter, um, I live in the city, and she said my daughter was in a class that you gave a presentation in, and later when she got pregnant in high school, she decided to keep the baby because she remembered the classroom presentation. And I think we need to go forward. It takes courage. It's not, as I said, especially following some of the classrooms where Planned Parenthood has been first. It's not easy. It takes courage. You have a lot of criticism, sometimes from the teachers. But the Right to Life Education Committee has been in existence since the beginning, and they have wonderful materials. And one of them that they send out, and they will even give to the schools, is fetal models. And that's an effective tool. And when the science teachers have those in their room, or we put them into a classroom with um, some of the nurses' office, it makes a difference. The nurses sometimes keep them in an inside office where the girls come in who are pregnant. So I think this is another area, the education, because for many of the people listening tonight about the, the dire consequences of late-term abortions, 
these facts, if they were revealed to young girls and watching the movie unplanned, taking it to a high school like Mercy, this makes the difference because they see the reality. I think I have a three-part question. Uh, Suzanne, Kathleen, and sorry, thank you. Uh, so, shortly after the legislative session opened, there I believed it was a diocesan-sponsored petition to support the Farm Workers Fair Protection Act. Why was there not a petition, or at least some uh, measure to alert voters back in October, November, about the consequences of their vote? Um, to, to dovetail off of your point, I found it quite hypocritical that I there was not a lot of education for the laity in October, November, and then after the legislative sessions opened, the church was very comfortable to say, oh, sign this petition to support, which, which I signed, I support, by the way, but it seemed an odd time to be silent about a much more important issue in my book. Uh, and then a few months later, the church seemed very, very loud and open to encouraging voters how to project their opinions. Um, the second part of my question is, how does, I guess sec, part two is, what has the church and the bishops learned from this, and how are they, do they have a plan or an agenda to properly inform the voters of New York State to elect the uh, officials that would overturn this act, if, if at all possible? And my third part would be, how does the church maintain its integrity if it's receiving state funds to support Catholic charities from the same legislators that voted to destroy the unborn? What does the church do to protect its integrity in that? Um, I, I think that's a, a, we have issues there. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, for lack of a better term. Thank you. Um, yes, that was a very difficult decision in the Diocesan Public Policy Committee. I mean, we knew at every year um, we do a public policy weekend um, in February. And um, there's a myriad of reasons why we do that. But we knew that that would be too late for um, abortion expansion to be the issue because we knew it was going to get voted on in January. I mean, Governor Cuomo had promised that from the get-go, that if the, if the Senate gets turned to Democrat, we will get this passed within 30 days. That was his promise. Of course, I see it as a threat, but, um, and so we knew, and then it became clear um, uh, early on that it was probably going to be right on January 22nd, which is the Roe v. Wade anniversary, and indeed it was. So we knew that. And so that's why it didn't become a public policy issue. However, um, we did work at getting the word out early in January. There was a bulletin insert, there was an effort, and it did result in many, many. How many emails were total at that time? Like 36,000. 36,000 statewide. So it was known, but I know it doesn't mean it happened in your parish or it was made aware in your parish. Um, but thank God, I mean, that's far, far more than any any other effort that the Catholic Conference has done, you know, generating emails. So, you know, it really did work. Um, but I, I, I get the frustration, though, of people who are like, wait a second, where did this come from? And I, I get it. And so certainly we do have our work cut out for us to make sure that we find even better avenues and use social media and use a lot of other ways that um, can really make sure the word gets out. Where was the voice January, February, March, April, May, June, July, all the way up to November, I think is, I, I think that's what you're expressing as well, right? I'm seeing head shaking here, like, why was that a public policy issue well before January? Well, it was our, our public policy issue for all the years preceding. We've never had a public policy Sunday or public policy platform that hasn't included a life issue. Um, and as Suzanne was saying, when we when we were looking at what needed to be the petition activity, the die was already cast for this particular legislation, um, and there was still an opportunity to sway votes towards um, the farm workers' rights. But it's never not been on our public policy agenda. Um, I think what 
maybe your part two of that question is what we need to do is figure out different platforms to making sure that folks are, are more informed. Uh, and we, we do transmit the information to, or to parish staff. We send out bulletin inserts, we send out announcements, we blast it all over our social media pages, but we, when it comes down to it, we can't force parish leadership to make the decision to promote it from the pulpit or to even you know, make the petitions and the educational material available in their pews. That, that really is at the discretion of the local pastor. There are, are incredible partners on all sorts, all sorts of issues, so that's not intended to be um, a slam to them, but you know, think, of, think of what's addressed and on concept and conversation at your, past, at your parish on any given Sunday. There's all sorts of demands for their attention. To your other point, your third point, um, we take very seriously looking at the funds that we receive from any particular source, not just our elected officials, but all sorts of um, revenue streams that we have within our corporation to make sure that in accepting them, we're not compromising our Catholic identity. We look at, um, we look at that very seriously, and actually there's litigation all over the place tied to an executive order in terms of complying with certain state requirements that we, we maintain certain religious exemptions from. So I can tell you to, to, without, without any doubt that my team, the executive team of Catholic Charities, looks very critically at where we will accept funds and how we will use them within our network to further our Catholic identity. To your education piece, Catholic Charities of Wayne County has a ridiculously large federal grant that puts them in every single school district in Wayne County to address communication and working with, parent, with, working with young teens so that they're ready to be making decisions to be parents. You know, essentially, many of them are already in that situation. But that was their educational piece to get in the door where we lost the funds to be able to have done that through abstinence ed dollars that went away. So, I mean, it, it's something that we're critical about. It's, I mean, it's not happenstance that that just happened to be my area of doctoral study. We did an analysis all through our, our diocesan structure, and not just ours, but Catholic Charities statewide. Um, and we're regularly working to improve how we make sure that we walk that line. Our orientation and onboarding processes for staff include extensive information on Catholic organizational identity so that they understand the tenets of Catholic social teaching and where our marching orders are. I think I see a staff person back there. They'll tell you that you know when they're in, in interactions with, with clients, there's decisions that they're not going to endorse support or even engage with clients because it's a violation of who we are. So, I mean, you know, I, I, can, I can tell you that we don't miss the opportunity to address it. I can tell you that we work desperately hard to make sure that we are um, operating in fidelity to Catholic social teaching. Thank you. To your second point, which was addressed to me, I can only tell you that I do know that the Cardinal Archbishop of New York and all the bishops are in serious conversation, meeting after meeting, about exactly what you said. Where do we go from here? What is our plan going forward in terms of elected officials? So I know those conversations are going on. I'm not in that room, so I can't tell you what, what's the fruit of it yet, but I know they're happening. I just want to tell you this one great story because I'm the one that wrote the bulletin insert back in November after the elections when we knew this was going to happen. I wrote a bulletin insert that went out through our diocesan coordinators in all eight dioceses of the state and then further went out to the parishes. But as Ellen just said, we, don't, we, don't, we can't guarantee what happens to it once it gets to the parish. The bulletin insert urged people to contact their elected officials on one side and then on the other side, it talked about, here are the services available in your community. If a pregnant, frightened young woman comes, here's where you can send her for pregnancy services, for post-abortion counseling, et cetera, et cetera. And I just have to tell you this one fabulous story because it helps me sleep at night that my bulletin insert did something good. In Buffalo, New York, there was a young woman, she was 15 years old, she found herself pregnant, and she was from a Catholic home, uh, they were Catholic, but they weren't really church-going. And she went to her parents, and she told them that she was pregnant. And the family together really didn't know what they were going to do. I mean, they, they were shocked that their 15-year-old daughter was pregnant, and they didn't know what to do. Her dad wandered into a Catholic church, not his church. I, I believe it was in Lackawanna. Wandered into the church. 
got down on his knees on the kneeler and started praying to God for answers. What do we do, Lord? What is your will here? And you know those little clips that are in the old-fashioned church where you put your hats? Yeah. Our bulletin insert was in one of those clips. And he pulled it out, and he read it, and he called our diocesan pro-life director in the Diocese of Buffalo, who runs pregnancy services in that diocese, and that girl is now bringing her baby to term. I sleep better at night knowing that. Okay, I just wanted to thank Dr. Um, Barry Parker for giving Feminist Choosing Life of New York a shout out. Um, as we all know, a lawsuit cannot move forward without a plaintiff. And so um, hopefully anyone interested, concerned about um, the Reproductive Health Act and the potential challenge will, you know, contact Feminist Choosing Life of New York. But I wanted to really address um, the earlier question, and that is, you know, there's a, I'm not Catholic, but I am Christian, and so this is just a personal question. I, 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 in terms of, of electoral politics, I'm wondering, I don't know the answer to this question, and that is, you know, can the Catholic Church, like, function as a political action committee? Are they able to affect or, you know, influence electoral politics? I mean, I understand they can do lobbying, you know, and it seems to me that a huge reason why the Reproductive Health Act passed was because of pro-choice special interest groups being extraordinarily effective in terms of affecting the midterm elections in, in, in you know, 2018. And so, can the Catholic Church do anything to affect electoral politics? Yeah. Simple answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> The simple answer is no. We are a 501c3 organization, tax exempt by the federal government and the IRS. Um, we do not have a political action committee. I think it would be virtually impossible for us to have one. Um, so no, we don't get involved. The bishops never instruct the Catholic faithful how to vote. We do, in fact, give um, guidance on forming consciences and taking faithful citizenship seriously and moral responsibilities, our moral obligation to be involved in politics. As Pope Francis says, it is our obligation to meddle in politics. Um, and I do full presentations on that, which we could get into at another time. Uh, okay, I, I just wanted to bring out an important point that I think is being missed this whole conversation. And I think it's great, and I've never seen such enthusiasm about uh, going to the woman and trying to do the things that you need to prevent her from wanting the abortion and doing the abortion. And uh, there's dichotomies and there's arguments on, on what to do and when to do. And just on that one point, on the, the Catholic Church cannot, it will lose its tax exemption if it endorses candidates. I don't think there's any penalty if it excommunicates some of the candidates. Some of the <laughs> candidates. Uh, <clears throat> but in any event, let me, let me give you this perspective. We, we've been fighting now for 50 years, and we didn't, we didn't realize that we were fighting with one arm behind our back. Because when Roe against Wade was passed, it said that abortion was allowed, it was a constitutional right in every state, and nobody could stop it, right up to partial birth abortion. There's a case on that. Uh, which meant the only avenue you, you had was to uh, put burdens on that would, would stop Planned Parenthood from doing some of the abortions, but we couldn't pass a law saying no abortions at six months or no abortions at eight months because it was a constitutional right. <clears throat> stop to think why. Uh, Governor Cuomo was so anxious to pass this. I mean, I'm not sure any amount of pressure would have stopped them. I think they have their pro-abortion legislators in place, majorities in both, both houses at this point, and nothing would have stopped them. But on the other hand, <clears throat> what is it they're worried about? Why, why did they go to such an extreme juvenile uh, situations to try to stop those two Supreme Court judges? I mean, I looked at that and I thought I was looking at a bunch of childhood kids you know, trying to stop it. And they had a, a fake accusation all the way up. And the reason is because the, those two judges follow Judge Scalia's originalist theory. And if, if it 
if it goes the way they they fear, it means that that it will no, you'll no longer have that arm tied behind your back. You could go to states, you could convince people that, uh, and you've done it already, you've gone 50% just on what you've done over the last 50 years. Uh, there was a, a candidate for president <coughs> that said he thinks abortions have gone down because of all the contraceptives everybody's using. Uh, I don't think that, just the opposite is probably true. But I think what is true is what you've done in the pro-life movement all these all these past years, and you can bring it home uh, once they once the, the, the Supreme Court hopefully goes back to the originalist theory that Judge Scalia endorsed. And I also think there's a possibility that a uh, Supreme Court that goes to the originalist theory may also say that a baby uh, out of the womb is a person for purposes of the Constitution, even though it came out through abortion. Uh, I think that may very well be, I don't know how far back they would go than that, but, but they will at least do that. So I think you should be encouraged. Uh, Carol's looking for a case. I don't think she needs a case. I think they passed the, the heartbeat bill, the ban on, on, on abortion up to the heartbeat, and I think that's already gone to a court, and they've already passed a, a ban on the ban. So I think it's going to move up pretty fast, I, I think and pray that we have a good, good success with the five judges that uh, are, are going to be uh, persuasive in that uh, situation. So I just think you ought to be very encouraged because the things that we are angry about is because we've won on that side of it, I hope, and that, uh, that that's going to come about. So keep your hopes up. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll have one last question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for being here, and I am sorry <laughs> it's so late asking this question, uh, but it's kind of specific. Um, do we know from a percentage standpoint how many women who are looking to have an abortion do not feel supported by the man in the picture? Because I think that that's an area to really try to tackle as a church um, to affirm masculinity, to affirm marriage and respect, and try to, before dealing with these consequences that may be young women are not feeling like they can make uh, to have the support of a, a masculine figure to then affirm her and to affirm the child. So I just wonder if we've thought about that at all, if there's any programs in place that I'm unaware of, or just some general thoughts on that. Funny you should mention that because I, I just happened to be on McQuaid's website last night and noticed that um, they always have a, a theme uh, for a program that they offer every year, uh, the Xavier Week. And, and this year's theme was on uh, how to be great men and, and understanding um, what that can entail and you know following uh, a biblical calling. So, so at least at one school, it was happening. Just a PS, because I think men have been bullied into yeah. thinking they can't talk about the abortion issue. Um, we cannot buy into the um, our bodies, our choice. Right. Slogans yeah. that we see out there, it's not. We have fathers, we have brothers, we have siblings, parents, and um, so I, I encourage men to speak up um, when they know women find themselves in this position or, and to support in the, you know, the situation where you are, find yourself as being an unexpected father to uh, support that woman in her decision. Um, I do know that there's a feminist from years ago, her name was Frederica Matthews Green, and she uh, was a pro-life feminist who did a lot of research and went to abortion clinics and interviewed women, and I remember out of that research that a large percentage of the women said that their male partners not only were not supportive, they were pressuring them to get the abortion. Yeah. Um, her research is out there somewhere on the internet, um, but I think that's an excellent point. And some, it's a it's a place where the church can play a definite role in terms of masculinity and fatherhood and values. So thank you for that. Well, this has been a great evening. On behalf of St. Bernard's, I would like to thank all of the panelists here. Uh, let's show our appreciation. Is there any wine left? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.